Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Dr. Edmund Baker and I'm your moderator for this discussion about prostate cancer as part of the Mayo Clinic Town Hall series. We have some amazing speakers that will educate us and answer questions for us this afternoon. So without further ado, I would like to introduce these dynamic physicians. First of all, I would like to talk about Dr. Mitchell Humphreys, who is the department chair and professor in the Department of Urology at Mayo Clinic. In addition, he serves as the dean of the Mayo Clinic School of Continuous Professional Development, as well as the Endourology Fellowship Director. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We also have Dr. Cassandra Moore. She's a hematologist oncologist at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Dr. Moore conducts cl clinical research trials in genital urinary oncology with a special focus in prostate cancer and is involved in the early therapeutics research program and is actively involved in healthcare disparities and health equity research and advocacy. Welcome. We have Dr. Jean-Claude Regima, who is a consultant and associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. He has completed residency uh, in the Radiation Oncology at U uh, UCLA, where he served as chief resident, followed by a Mayo Scholar Proton Fel uh, Therapy Fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. He treats primary head and neck cancer and genital urinary malignancies. Welcome. Thank you. We have Dr. No uh, Donald Norfell, who is the Associate Medical Director of the Breast Clinic at Mayo Clinic, Arizona, where he is responsible for the care of many patients with breast cancer. He also sees a substantial number of other cancer types. He is the Site Director for the Center of Health and Equity and Community Engagement Research in Arizona. This program highlights underserved populations and their need for greater access to cancer care and representation in medicine. His work involves complex situations and treatment decisions for cancer patients at a high stress time for patients. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Baker. We have Dr. Dwayne McIntosh, who's a prostate cancer survivor. He was diagnosed with cancer in June of 2020 after having a PSA reading of 16. He underwent surgery on September 23rd, 2020 to remove the prostate and the cancer. Even though he has three master's degrees and a doctoral degree, he knew very little, very little about prostate cancer. His surgery was a success and today he is cancer free. Only after he discovered his cancer did he find out his father had prostate cancer as well that spread to his colon, which ultimately led to his death? Welcome, Dr. McIntosh. Thank you. And last, but definitely not least, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Marion Kelly, who serves as the Director for the Office of Community and Business Relations within Public Affairs at Mayo Clinic. In this role, Mr. Kelly provides leadership for the organization's effort to build solid neighborhood, civic, and corporate relationships. He serves his local community as co-chair diversity leadership alliance chair, National Multiple Sclerosis uh, Society of Arizona affiliate board, the Scottsdale Area Chamber of Commerce board, as well as community celebrating diversity board. Marion uh, is a life member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, uh, and also a member of a Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, Gamma Mu Boule. Welcome, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Uh, so for everyone who's listening in, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if there's questions tonight, which I hope there are many, please use the uh, buttons at the bottom of the screen where it says questions and answers to be able to type in and uh, ask questions or use the chat feature. They will be fielded by those that are helping me this evening and I can help facilitate, facilitate it into the conversation. So 
thank you so much for being attentive for that part. So we would like to start. And uh, the first question up for answering is, what is prostate cancer? And helping us along with that answer will be Drs. Moore and Humphreys. Please take the mic. Well, thank you, Dr. Baker. It's, it's an honor to be with everybody tonight. And I think this is an extremely important topic, especially as prostate cancer awareness comes up. Just to give everybody a little background. So when we have the conversation, we're speaking from the same place. The prostate is basically a gland that sits in front of the bladder in men. It's only function other than to cause us problems as we get later in life is for fertility. It's the gland that allows us to have fertility, to have children and those kind of things. As we get older, the prostate grows bigger, can make it difficult to urinate, but it can also harbor cancer. And that's really what we hope to spend most of tonight talking about is prostate cancer, because the overall lifetime risk of prostate cancer is about one in six to one in eight men. But fortunately for those that do have prostate cancer, only about one in 35 die from the disease, but it is still a prevalent disease. So if you look in the United States today, um, there's about 300,000 new diagnoses per year and still about 30 to 35,000 men per year die of prostate cancer. And it's the second most common cause of cancer death in men after lung cancer. So it is a significant problem affecting our men and our families. And it's something that we should really think about. Um, as we think about prostate cancer, when we talk about the cancer itself, there's two ways of thinking about it, either localized disease where the disease is localized to the prostate and hasn't gone anywhere or spread anywhere or metastatic disease. So Dr. Moore, what, how would you describe uh, the difference between localized and metastatic disease and what should people be thinking about? Sure. Thank you. Um, so, as Dr. Humphreys stated, you know, the majority of, of men will present with localized disease, and, and that's one of the reasons why we encourage um, screening because, um, or, and we can have that, or at least having a discussion with your doctor about screening, and we can talk about that further. Um, but when the disease is localized to the prostate gland um, or to some extent um, the local uh, lymph nodes, there's still some options for management. Um, and as long as it's localized to the gland, we can still be talking about curative therapy. Um, once the disease has spread out to beyond the gland to the lymph nodes or other sites, then it's really much more of a long-term management situation. Um, and um, the, it's a little different approach um, in terms of, of uh, treatment options and, and how to manage it. It, I, I think it's really important to think about that today with screening, much fewer men present with metastatic disease than ever before. And when we talk about screening, it's important to talk to your doctor and your providers about that. When we talk about screening for prostate cancer, usually it involves a digital rectal exam where we use our fingers to feel the prostate for any lumps or bumps. Some men are a bit squeamish, may feel that it's a little bit uncomfortable, but it is part of normal health maintenance where we really inspect that prostate. And really the, the landmark thing that has changed prostate cancer and it's decreased prostate cancer mortality by about 40% in the last two decades has been the advent of PSA. And PSA is a simple blood test that looks at your blood levels of a certain marker that's associated with prostate cancer. However, an elevated PSA doesn't necessarily mean cancer. It can be elevated because of inflammation, infection, the size of your prostate, but it can be associated with prostate cancer. So when we see that elevated PSA, it's really important to follow that up with other tests. And we may get into some conversation around that a little bit more. And Cassandra, I don't know how you feel about screening, but at least what I tell my patients is the most important PSA a man will have anywhere in their life is their PSA in their 40s. And because we know from natural history studies that a PSA in your 40s of around 0.7 is very predictive. If your PSA is above that, a standard deviation above that, your lifetime risk of prostate cancer is much higher. Your lifetime risk of death from prostate cancer is much higher. So that very first screening PSA that men get in their 40s is really quite predictive of what's going to happen, even if you don't have cancer at that time. In fact, that PSA data has shown is more important than race, ethnicity, or even family history of prostate cancer. So 
I usually have my men uh, screen in their late 40s, get that very first PSA. And then screening doesn't necessarily have to be an every year event. It may be a cup every two years, but a lot of it depends on your PSA, your symptoms, and that conversation with your uh, provider. Yes, um, if you look, the recommendations uh, really vary um, based on you know who who is making them. I think the U.S. Pre Preventative Task Force had had a much more conservative um, recommendation, um, and they did amend that, thankfully, um, because people like the American Cancer Society and obviously American Urologic Society that are dealing with these prostate cancer, um, you know, mandated that it is important to really consider, as, as Dr. Humphreys said, um, and that there, it is important um, to know those numbers. And so they have um, adjusted that a little bit, talking about, you know, at least in in um, your 50s, and I would agree with Dr. Humphreys in your 40s, um, to, uh, to have that conversation with your doctor about risk benefit and, and um, really talking about what screening entails and what it means for you specifically. And, you know, I, I don't think PSA is a perfect screening test, but it's the best we have right now. And when we come to the diagnosis of prostate cancer, we have new tools available to us that weren't around 10 years ago. Um, so no longer are we doing uh, random prostate biopsies, but now we're doing MRI guided fusion, fusion biopsies to really know more about the cancer and the biology of the disease. The important part in the conversation is really to make sure you're getting screening, protecting your health. Because if you have a family history of prostate cancer, you have twofold risk of having prostate cancer. And it's more important if your brother has prostate cancer than your father, but the risks are still high. But if your brother or a sibling has prostate cancer, it's a much higher risk. And if you have two people in your family that have a risk of prostate cancer, it's even a higher risk of you having prostate cancer, even fivefold. The other thing we know about risk factors in prostate cancer, and it is more prevalent in the African-American population. Um, the African-American population, 1.6 increased risk of getting prostate cancer and a twofold increase of dying from prostate cancer. To put it simply, what it shows is prostate cancer, when it affects African-Americans, they're at a younger age. It's a more aggressive disease with a worse prognosis. So it's even more important to screen and identify prostate cancer among those patients. So as, as we go on into um, other things with risk factors, and um, there is some genetic components with it. So we talked a little bit about family history, talked a little bit about an ethnicity. There's other genetic texts that can link prostate cancer, and it's very similar to breast cancer and how that's passed down hereditary. There's two specific genes um, called the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 that are associated with prostate cancer. The BRCA2 gene is more predictive and it has a stronger link to prostate cancer than the BRCA1. But these are things that if you get prostate cancer at a younger or earlier age, it may be worth your while to get some genetic testing for your family. Or if breast cancer runs in your family, it may be worth getting genetic testing. And typically we see this with younger patients where it becomes much more important. I don't know, Cassandra, how often do you reckon, recommend genetic testing for your, for your folks? Right. So with all, pretty much all of the um, men that present with high risk disease and, you know, are, are getting, I mean, it's, it's pretty much standard of care across the board. They're getting um, uh, genetic testing as well as um, obviously a family history. Um, so we, we do quite a bit of it and it, it can be very informative. Yeah. And I think for some people that do know something about prostate cancer and don't, when we think about prostate cancer, we think about it in basically six prognostic categories that help lean us towards treatments. Um, very low risk prostate cancer, low risk prostate cancer, intermediate favorable prostate cancer, intermediate unfavorable, high risk disease, and very high risk disease. And as Dr. Moore pointed out, that high risk and very high risk disease those are typically ones that may need more than one kind of treatment to work towards that curative potential or even prolong the life. But what I would say with prostate cancer, for the most part, is a slow growing malignancy. But we have to be aware because it has shown and evidence has shown that in the African-American population is a more aggressive disease. So we have to be more aggressive with that treatment uh, to get the same curative outcomes uh, that we want to see with this disease for survivability. 
you may also have heard about different numbers associated with prostate cancer. Gleason 6 prostate cancer, Gleason 7 prostate cancer, Gleason 3 plus 4, 4 plus 3. What does all that mean? That's essentially the, something that we use to communicate um, the grade of the actual cancer cells themselves. So what happens is, is if you have a biopsy and if you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, we look at that tissue underneath the microscope and we grade those cells that we see from the most common pattern we see. We grade it as three low grade, four intermediate or five high grade. And the second most common pattern we see, we grade it on the same system. So in other words, somebody may have Gleason 7 cancer, but the person that has Gleason 3 plus 4 cancer is that intermediate favorable category where the person that has 4 plus 3 cancer may be that intermediate unfavorable category. There is some nuance to this that we also look at PSA, we look at imaging and some other factors, how many biopsies were positive. But globally, when you think about prostate cancer, you can think about Gleason 3 plus 3 as being low-grade disease, Gleason 7 as being intermediate disease, and anything that comes back with a Gleason score of 8, 9, and 10 being high-grade, very high-grade disease that really needs some form of treatment because it will affect you, whether it's localized, and hopefully we can treat it before it's metastatic or prevent metastatic disease. One thing that uh, I see there is a uh, question in the um, uh, question thing about somebody that said that they had a prostatectomy in 2019, uh, concluded that it had not metastasized, but then this year recently, two years later, the PSA came back um, and then they underwent salvage radiation therapy. Dr. Moore, so we, we call this biochemical recurrence if it's just a PSA, if we can't find disease. Can you talk a little bit about what happens and, and why we check PSA after surgery and what it means when we find it and how we find it? Sure. Um, so, you know, once obviously the, the with surgery and the prostate gland is removed along with the prostate cancer, we really shouldn't be seeing any uh, PSA um, present um, since that, that is generated by the prostate gland and the prostate cancer cells. So we do watch that closely following surgery. Um, ideally, it will get to an undetectable level, and then we hope that it stays there for the duration. Um, but we do monitor it regularly every few months initially. Um, and if we do start to see it rise, uh, um, two serial elevations will confirm what we call biochemical recurrence. And with that, depending upon the level of the PSA, um, we may opt for additional imaging um, to look to see if we can see a site of disease. Um, and uh, Dr. Rajema will be able to speak to you about um, radiation therapy in that situation. But we also look at how quickly the PSA is rising, the doubling time, um, and to see how aggressively that prostate cancer is returning. And that will determine whether we need to initiate any therapy or whether we can watch it for a period of time. I'm sure we'll get into more of that discussion um, later on as well when we outline you know, treatment strategies. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for that. Uh, I will wrangle the questions and bring them to you at the end uh, because some of the other great discussions will probably cover some of the uh, questions that they're asking. So uh, thank you so much for helping us uh, about answering the question, what is prostate cancer? Now I wanna move into a discussion about the impact of the disease. And uh, Drs. McIntosh and Humphreys, please join me at the mic. Thank you so much. And, and, and help me uh, understand what is the impact uh, to patients uh, and also uh, the impact to a population. Yeah, so I, I would really like to uh, start and throw this to uh, Dr. McIntosh and have him relate kind of his experience. And then if there's questions about treatment diagnosis and, and those kind of things, I can chirp in. But I know that um, Dr. McIntosh went through this and knows firsthand what it's like. And he's also been really a champion of uh, going out and uh, attacking this straight on. And uh, we've had many conversations about this. So uh, Dr. McIntosh, if you want to kind of relate some of your thoughts and stories, and, and I'm here to support and help uh, through that. Well, thank you, Dr. Humphrey. Uh, <clears throat> as you well know, as I as uh, was stated earlier, uh, I was diagnosed with cancer a little bit over a year ago, and uh, it was uh, probably the most shocking thing that I had to go through in my life. And uh, 
I had got checked with PA, uh, my PSA level and came back at a 16 and I never knew what it was really, to be frank and honest with you. And um, as an African-American, no one ever told me, and I don't call myself uneducated, uh, but once I discovered that I had it, and actually going to the Mayo Clinic was my second opinion. Uh, and so meeting with Dr. Humphrey and him explaining it to me, uh, you know, first thing I thought was, was okay, uh, you know, was I gonna have my manly function, you know? so. <laughs> Uh, I, I just to be frank and honest with you, yeah. it, you know, it went from cancer to, you know, man, you know, I'm a black man and I got pride and, you know, I'm young, you know, I still got a lot of young life to live and, you know, hey, man, you're telling me I'm going to be infant, you know, and uh, so anyway, to move him from that, he just, he was very frank and honest with me and I appreciated that, you know, and he said, you know, the first matter is to let's get rid of the cancer and save your life. You know, there's uh, things that we can do to, you know, make sure that you can get an erection, you know, but let's focus on the first things first. And so that really kind of eased my mind uh, in helping me to really understand, first of all, what prostate cancer was and how it affected me. And along the way, you know, I found out, I thought all these years that my father had passed the colon cancer. And I found out that it had really started with prostate cancer. And all these years, I was getting colonoscopies, you know, thinking I was doing the right thing, but never knew the reality of what had happened. So go fast forward, you know, by, uh, you know, by all the miracles, you know, from whoever your higher power is, you know, uh, surgery was very successful. Uh, they had to remove some, uh, uh, I don't want to say polish, but uh, and Dr. Humphrey, you can help me here. Uh, yeah. The, the lymph nodes? Lymph nodes, thank you. Yep, yep. They, they removed some lymph nodes outside. So anyway, you know, I've had about three or four screenings and all of them came back negative. So at this point, I'm, uh, you know, uh, cancer-free. I can, you know, be honest and say that, you know, uh, as far as the erection, it has been a challenge for me. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I have opted to uh, take the shot therapy but I can tell you, it, it has not altered my life in any way. Uh, I'm very grateful. I, I understand it. And my goal is, is that I, I, I understand from a psychological perspective as a black man, that it's very difficult to talk about these kind of things. But I think it's so, so important that we begin to have those conversations very young, not, 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 not at the screening age of 40 or whatever, but I think those conversations need to start happening at the dinner table as early as high school, as we begin to talk about sex and all these other things and, 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 and having, you know, using condoms and, uh, you know, protective things. I think those conversation about prostate cancer needs to happen as well, because I went to my doctor. I never had my doctor talk about those things. So I'm going to just be honest and say, we can't leave it up to our doctors to talk about those things. We need to talk about those things and initiate those conversations uh, with it. Because I can tell you that I hadn't been tested in three years and I didn't know what it was. And that's why I'm saying I'm very passionate about it. And I'm not too ashamed to say what I felt and what I went through, because I think it's very, very, very important because it's really saving lives. And I gotta say, thank you, Dr. Humphrey and all the people at Mayo Clinic, because if it wasn't for what you guys did for me, I'm not so sure I'd be here today. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think that what your experience is is a real experience, because when you hear that cancer diagnosis, it's real. And you can intellectually get through some of those things, but you hear the word cancer and then you hear the side effects from some of the treatments, you know, urinary incontinence, leaking urine, erectile dysfunction, impotence, um, changes from radiation, hormone therapy, changing uh, your, your kind of hormone levels, your energy, your libido. You know, you, you hear all the scary things. And um, when you think about prostate cancer, you, you want to know that something's out there and that you can trust the environment that you're in. And, and I think the, I think you hit the point right on the fact in that 
it's important to have these conversations and to take them on because I think it's not exclusive, but I think a lot of times men are hesitant to have these conversations and oftentimes have these conversations after the fact, after they've been treated, they find people that have been treated and they talk to them, but not talking to the vulnerable populations. And we know that the disease is more aggressive, it progresses faster and has a worse prognosis than African-American men. We absolutely need to target and make this information part of their normal day-to-day -day thing and, and take away some of the stereotypes. And I think through um, having somebody courageous and willing to share their story and their journey through all this, is so important and, and probably um, will impact as many lives as we can do in treatment and other things because you can reach so many different things and have that non-biased opinion from your perspective. So when you went through your journey, was the most uh, important thing to you, the, the concern about the can how, how did you relate your priorities in terms of cancer, longevity, side effects? Wh where did you rank that in your mind, in your life, and how it fits with you? Well, when I initially first, when I first heard that I had cancer, I thought it was a death sentence, you know, because everybody, you know, again, my father passed of cancer, and, you know, other folks in my family died of cancer. So, you know, that was my initial reaction. And once I accepted the fact that I was going to die, then it became a pride thing. You know, as a black man, I'm saying, you know, all my life I was conditioned to think, you know, the only thing I really had was my pride, you know, and, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, the label that you got is that, okay, you know, black man, you perform well in the bedroom, you know, and I think that goes along with the pride, but the psychological impact, I think was the most important thing for me was to say that I was stripped of everything you know, the only thing that I was holding on to, and I'm now stripped of it. So it almost like ripped me of my purpose, if you will, so to speak. And so I kind of felt deflated, you know, and I felt like I was out there by myself and no one really understood, you know, and even trying to get a place where I could talk to someone. And I didn't feel like even, and I have to be honest, I didn't even feel like you understood because I seen you as a white man. Sure. And I'm like, okay, he's a doctor. He doesn't understand me as a black man. I mean, he sits behind his desk with a tie on and all of that. You know, he's going to tell me what he thinks I want to hear. So there was a disconnect for me. And I was just like, where do I go? Who can I really talk to that understands me? You know, not my disease, not the cancer, but understands me and what I'm going through. So I really struggled. I really, really struggled with that. And I guess because I'm a counselor by trade myself, I had to really dig deep in myself and say, okay, you can be the victim or you can step out of your victim role and say, hey, if this is all you have to live, don't waste it being the victim, live it to the best and the fullest you can. So at that point, I turned the tables and say, hey, if I'm gonna die, let me save somebody else's life. So at that point, I made a conscious decision to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to be, if I can be the spokesperson or if I can be the face of colon, I mean, uh, prostate cancer, then so be it. And that was my turning point. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's remarkable. It's remarkable what you've been through. I'm just glad you're doing so well. <laughs> and I'm glad your disease is in the rear view mirror. Uh, but it, it is a lot to take in, especially with the thoughts and the emotions and uh, everything that goes through that. You know, and I think another thing is there's a lot of misconceptions that, you know, I know that I had in talking to other African Americans in the community, you know, uh, you know, a lot of them think that, you know, this test that something's going to be stuck down their penis, you know, and like, like you're testing for an STD. You know, I've heard, I've talked to a lot, man, I don't want nothing stuck down there, man, that hurts and all, you know, it's just so many misconceptions out there that's unbelievable that's keeping, you know, folks from going and really getting tested. So, you know, I'm hoping that uh, and with all these efforts that's being made, that uh, people will understand that, you know, this is not a death sentence and it doesn't have to be a death sentence, that there is uh, treatment for it and that the best treatment is early detection. Dr. McIntosh, Dr. Humphrey, that was amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, just everyone listening, just imagine that you're sitting at the dinner table right now 
uh, and getting this information because that's where we African Americans get our information. Dinner table, church pulpit, this is the trusted information that's important. And Dr. McIntosh, you have gone a step further and brought uh, uh, your experience to the table so that people can hear you, understand your concerns, and then uh, they can then feel that they are part of a community that's had the same concerns and can help move forward with getting better and dealing with this disease. Thank you so much for that discussion. We're going to uh, move just a step further into what are the actual treatment options. And, and uh, the doctors are gonna help me with this are Drs. Humphrey, uh, Dr. Uh, Regima, and also uh, Dr. Uh, McIntosh. I would turn it over. Maybe we should start with uh, the radiation therapy for localized prostate cancer, and, and then we can uh, bring in the surgical perspective afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Humphreys. So um, I'm the radi radiation oncologist on the panel, and uh, so oftentimes when you think about radiation therapy for early stage, uh, you know, there are three main options that we think of. If it's low grade, you can actually watch and wait. But if it's someone who's younger who wants curative treatment, then uh, radiation therapy is definitely a good option, uh, alternative option to surgery. And there are several considerations that we have to keep in mind. Uh, oftentimes, it has to do a lot of times can be preference for the patient, or some patients may be more suitable to radiation. Um, so I would say that uh, radiation therapy, let me just kind of go over the different types of radiation therapy. Uh, when you, you think about radiation therapy, there are two broad categories. There's uh, external beam radi radiation therapy, and then there's brachytherapy. Uh, generally speaking, most patients are treated with external beam radiation therapy where we're doing multiple treatments on a daily basis during the week. Historically, we used to do more like eight to nine weeks. We've learned over time how to shorten it to five weeks, even to five days. Um, and then with, within that, uh, the category of external beam radiation therapy, you can have uh, the traditional radiation, uh, which is uh, basically X-rays or photons, or sometimes called IMRT, intensity modulated radiotherapy. And then in the last decade, uh, we, we've learned how to use another form of radiation therapy called proton therapy, uh, which is also delivered in the same way uh, in terms of like being a daily treatment. However, uh, given the physical properties of the proton therapy, we consider it much more precise and uh, basically it allows us to minimize uh, exposure to normal tissues and uh, potential side effects of, of uh, treatment. Uh, brachytherapy is, uh, is also done for low-grade can uh, cancer. Or, um, it's typically two types. Uh, there's what's called radiotherapy. We don't do that here at, May, uh, at Mayo Clinic, uh, especially given the, the advent of proton therapy, uh, but it can also be a viable option in some patients. There's also something called high dose red brachytherapy. Uh, and it, typically speaking, uh, you, you can have one or two treatments for uh, low grade cancer. So that's uh, pretty much kind of in a nutshell, uh, as far as radiation therapy types. Are there certain patients that are better for radiation than um, without radiation? And wh where do you fall on um, with concomitant or same time treatment with hormone therapy? And how do, how do you fit that in to where you think about radiation? So oftentimes I would say that the patient who is ideal for radiation therapy is one who is older, who may not tolerate surgery as well. Um, and of course, once you think about you know, the aggressiveness of the cancer, that's when you can combine radiation therapy with hormone therapy. So that's meaning intermediate risk and higher. You can do uh, androgen deprivation therapy or hormone therapy, which is basically an injection given typically for six months for intermediate risk prostate cancer, uh, one time shot. And then uh, for higher risk disease, you can we have uh, up to a uh, minimum of three shots, 18 months or more. So another thing is you see a lot of um, people in insurance saying, well, proton beam, Mayo's got this brand new proton machine center that they did. And it, you hear people talk about pencil beam. 
what does that mean to the patient? And are protons really better than photons in prostate cancer? Because, right, proton therapy has been around since 1947. We built our center in 2016, 17, somewhere when around we, there. When we started treating. Yeah, so that's a good question. So proton therapy has undergone some sort of evolution over time. Uh, we have centers like Lomalinda that treated years ago. And some of the older data really, when you kind of compare head to head, it kind of not clear whether uh, that protons are superior. So now with more recent technology, uh, pencil beam that you hear about, it's much more focused radiation therapy that we're actually actively uh, undergoing, do, uh, running clinical trials to establish that truly what we see when, we, when you compare plants head to head, uh, we do see a clear benefit in terms of like minimizing uh, spillage of radiation to critical structures like the bladder and rectum. But obviously that needs to be investigated in clinical trials uh, and that takes time to, like, to demonstrate. Uh, but we do believe based on our own internal data uh, that patients are doing better, again, based on the fact that with uh, the ability to focus radiation better, you can minimize those going to normal tissues. And, and I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was, what was the second part of the question? So I was just say it was mostly just, you know, I think there's a lot of confusion between protons and photons in the community. What's the different, which cancers treat better and what the, what the treatment program is for that, right? So, you know, on the table for 10 to 15 minutes, dose escalation. Uh, and then in terms of side effects, maybe we should talk a little bit about side effects. And do you have any strategies to minimize the side effects like space OIR gel and what that is for people and, and how that can help them? Right. That's, so let me kind of go over side effects in general for radiation therapy in general. And then I kind of say how proton therapy can help. Uh, when, when patients are undergoing radiation therapy, there's what we consider short-term side effects or acute side effects. Basically, things that are relatively speaking mild, moderate in severity that gradually resolve shortly after completing treatment. So a little bit of fatigue, some irritation of the bladder causing urinary frequency urgency, sometimes a little burning of the urination, sometimes loose stools, frequent bowels, and we have ways to manage these and relatively, uh, generally speaking, these resolve. And uh, there are also what we consider late effects of radiation therapy. And these are relatively uncommon, but much more severe, except for one of them is actually quite common and uh, is erectile dysfunction can affect patients uh, up to 30 to 50% of patients uh, in three to five years to varying degrees. And that's related to scarring of the blood vessels around the prostate that get exposed to radiation and um, cause impotence because of reduced blood flow. And the other things that you can see months, years down the road after radiation, you can see uh, risk of uh, bleeding with urination or bowel movements from irritating blood vessels in the bladder, which is right in, in, in front of the prostate. And the same thing in the rectum. There can be some bleeding uh, in the, with bowel movements. And most of those cases are mild, but there are cases in about three to five percent that actually need to be treated. And uh, in general, the treatments are successful. There's different ways to address that. So when we plan with proton therapy, uh, we typically use fewer beams uh, because protons. They have. Uh, we generally speaking. We use two beams that come from uh, the pelvis, and each beam has the ability to stop uh, beyond the, uh, the edge of the target, meaning that we have almost no exit doors, basically, and that minimizes uh, uh, the, the doors back beyond the prostate. So that gives us the ability to, uh, to minimize those to the bladder, and so, and as well as to the rectum, those being sort of the two uh, most critical organs that we worry about. And so we believe that with long-term follow-up in our ongoing clinical trials, we're going to be able to demonstrate that you can reduce, uh, you can, the reduction in those, those organs can translate into a few uh, long-term side effects. Um, when we are planning uh, radiation, as you were alluding to, now we have, uh, we use MRI 
uh, to plan the radiation, which allows us to minimize uh, the overall volume of treatment. Uh, we also use these markers that are placed by urology uh, in, the, in the prostate, almost kind of like a biopsy, uh, but less, in, less invasive. And, um, and then for the right patients with uh, low grade or early stage, we also use something called spacer at the time of uh, the markers place, placement. Uh, and that's basically a gel that's injected between the prostate and the rectum to push the rectum away from the prostate. And that allows us to basically minimize further dose that goes to the rectum. So with all that combined with image guidance, with MRI and the markers and, and, uh, and the space or we see, and obviously planning with proton therapy, which has less spillage of radiation, we see much less uh, collateral. And, and we believe that over time, that's going to establish, uh, you know, the latest proton technology is superior than uh, traditional radiation with x-rays, which basically go through and through tissues and have a lot more uh, overlap with normal tissues. That's great. So I, I think that, uh, you know, radiation is a very good and viable tool for um, localized disease, both low and high grade. And, and it's one of the important tools in our armamentarium. The other thing we do is surgery. That's what I do every other day. I, I put the markers in for the radiation in the space OAR, but we also, I also do the surgery. And uh, just talking about a little bit about the surgery for localized prostate cancers. We used to do the surgery by making an incision from the belly button down to the pubic bone. Now we do the same surgery, but instead of that big incision, we work through little keyholes or little ports uh, through something called laparoscopy or at the end of instruments. But now it's more advanced because I, we actually do a robot assisted laparoscopy where there's actually a robot on the patient and I operate from a console where we can see in three dimensions and we do the same surgery. When we do the surgery, our number one goal is cure the cancer. Number two goal is to preserve the sphincter to keep men from leaking urine. And our third goal is to preserve the neurovascular bundles for erections. One thing to think about is the neurovascular bundles is really a very um, small, delicate plexus of very small nerves that surround the prostate. And we have to push those out of the way just to get the prostate out. Sometimes by pushing them away, you get that erectile dysfunction. And then over the next 12 to 18 to 24 months, erections come back. Sometimes they don't come back and need additional therapies. But for the most part with surgery, the risk of uh, needing a blood transfusion is very low, less than uh, 1% in our patients. Now, when we do surgery, patients go home the same day or the very next day. Uh, they have a fully catheter in their bladder for five to seven days after their surgery. And they got to take it easy for about a month. The biggest thing, and it'll be interesting to hear Dr. McIntosh, is people start feeling better a couple weeks after surgery because they don't have big incisions to recover from. And so it's really hard because there's still stitches on the inside that need to heal to hold yourself back from doing too much extraneous activity uh, to let things on the inside heal. So we say people can get back to their regular activity four to six weeks, basically, after surgery. The other things that we worry about with surgery is uh, we always sample the lymph nodes as well, because cancer likes to go to some lymph nodes in the pelvis. And we sample those to make sure there's no cancer there. Because if there is cancer in the lymph nodes, then we need to do additional treatment. If there's no cancer in the lymph nodes, that tells us that the cancer probably has not spread anywhere, at least as much as we can tell. Um, the consequence of removing those lymph nodes is sometimes you can get a fluid collection called a lymphocele. Three to 5% of the time, we have to go back in and do something about that surgically. Um, but surg surgery, from when I started 25 years ago, is completely different uh, today. It's much more uh, less invasive. Um, and that is another option for localized prostate cancer for local control. Because when you have prostate cancer, even if it's metastatic, you've got to come up with some way for local control. And then you've got to think about some way to treat the cancer in the rest of your body. There's other ways we can treat prostate cancer through focal ablation, HIFU, some things like that. There's a lot of options out there. And not all prostate cancers need to be treated. Some are not lethal. The trick is figuring out which ones are the lethal cancers versus which ones are the unlethal cancers. But in a study done specifically in the African-American population with low risk, low grade prostate cancer, 60% of those patients progressed to needing treatment. Whereas when you looked at the non-African-American population, only 49% of those patients progressed, even with low grade, low volume disease. 
what that tells us is, is that in the African-American population, we need to be more aggressive with the disease. It's not that active surveillance, keeping an eye on PSA, imaging, repeat biopsy, isn't a viable strategy, but we need to have a heightened sense of awareness to treat, to still get that curative potential. So I'd be interested to hear from Dr. McIntosh's perspective, what you thought about going into surgery, what you thought about coming out of surgery and kind of what that recovery journey was like for you. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, well, first thing that, that, I, that I would say is, is that, you know, if I would have known then what I know now, one of the things I would encourage is that some of the therapy that I went through after surgery, I would have preferred to go through before, like the tighten of the stomach muscles and stuff of that nature. I think it would have been very helpful. However, after surgery, um, you know, the catheter definitely was one of the things, the leakage uh, was an issue. Uh, but the main thing is, is to take it easy. Um, it was very difficult because again, you know, being the breadwinner and having to work and all those things of that nature. And um, it was very difficult for me, as you stated about, you know, especially right after I got the catheter out, you know, I had the catheter in for a week, but right after I got it out, it was very uh, difficult for me not to overextend myself. Uh, you know, I even, you know, and, and I have to say, you know, I got an erection and, you know, I wanted to have, you know, intercourse and had intercourse and uh, it was one of those false positives, you know, so I thought, oh, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I got my manhood back, but uh, it was, it was one of those false positives. So that took off to me thinking that I could do other things as well as, you know, everything was fine. And so from a psychological perspective, again, that was a setback for me as well. So my thing would be is to be real with yourself and to say that, you know, even though you may get signs of hope that, you know, it may not be long lasting and to give yourself that space and to be say that, you know, it's going to take me, you know, you know, I mean, like they said, four to eight weeks. Well, you know, give yourself six months. You know, if it happens earlier, that's fine. But from a psychological perspective, I think to say four to eight weeks is really a setup for disappointment. I know for me it was. And so my advice would be give yourself longer than you really need. And to be honest and frankly, I would say give yourself six months to a year to really recuperate and not give yourself a limited amount of time because everything that you do it's going to have a mental and physical effect on you. So it's one of those things where if you give yourself longer than you need and it happens before that time, you feel like you won the lottery, right? But if it doesn't, then it's like you beat yourself up, sort of kind of speak. So one thing that I did learn from it is, is to, you know, and I don't like to use the word realistic because what does that mean? You know what I'm saying? I guess I'm putting on my counselor hat because what realistic means to you may be very different for me. So I want to say, give yourself enough time and that you're not setting yourself up for failure. And I think that's the best thing that I could say. And also make sure that you get your exercise. You know, walk. When you first get out, walk. As much as you can stand to walk, that's the best therapy that you can really get. I think one of the things that I did is I felt so good that I tried to overdo it and then I compensated for not working out or not walking. And then I found myself regressing. And so one of the things I would say is walk as much as you can, you know, just don't overdo it and give yourself enough time to heal and, you know, don't push yourself beyond your ability to do so. That's some really good information, Dr. McIntosh. Uh, if doctors Moore and Redeemer could add in about what's it like to manage uh, uh, not a localized disease uh, like was previously discussed, but what about the metastatic disease and what are some other uh, options for those people? Sure. Um, so I think the good thing about prostate cancer, as we've heard um, other uh, panelists discuss is just the advances that we've made in medicine, you know, um, from a radiation uh, oncology standpoint, from a surgical standpoint, and again, with, with medical oncology, systemic therapy. So 
Um, even if you do have a disease that has spread and is metastatic, it's, as I mentioned previously, it's really a, a long-term, more of a control process. It's really about extending the therapies that we have to keep control of the disease until the next um, new therapy comes along. And, you know, back in 2004 was the first time we had docetaxel, which is a chemotherapy that was um, shown to improve um, survival in, in metastatic disease. And then every couple of years, we were making advances new agents coming out so that we've had probably 10 in the past, um, actually, probably 10 in the past year from 2014, 2004 to 2020, and now we probably had another five just in the past year um, with more to come. So, um, you know, we, we talk about hormone therapy being the mainstay of treatment for prostate cancer um, because those prostate cancer cells are very sensitive to um, the manipulation of testosterone, and they do need that to grow. And so the, the first thing that we, we talk about is hormone therapy. Um, and then there are other agents um, that we are now, that initially we would use after hormone therapy um, stopped working in some people. Um, now we're using that earlier, knowing that it, using the combination can actually um, stretch out that time that it's, that it's still useful. And then there's chemotherapy as well. Um, so, um, I'm happy to talk about, you know, um, what hormone therapy is and, and, and that kind of, well, like. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And, okay. and, you know, Dr. Baker, if I could, if I could just add one other thing, you know, in regards to the therapy after the surgery. One thing is, is that you're going to have leakage. I just want to make it real clear. Men's are gonna have leakage. The best thing, one of the things is, is that when you go urinate and they're telling you to hold your urine, it's gonna become very comfortable not to do it. You know, I would say, make sure you do it because that's gonna really help you to, you know, to stop that leakage from happening. But it's gonna happen and you're gonna have some accidents and just be, be aware and, and not, not feel uncomfortable with that. Just know that it's going to happen. So I just wanted to, to, to say that because that was one of the things that really bothered me because I was in a public vineyard and it happened and it was kind of embarrassing. But uh, I think if you're, if you know that it's going to happen and you're prepared for it, it, it it's less uh, traumatic. Thank you so much. Dr. Moore, you were talking more about uh, hormone therapy. Sure. And I think that, you know, um, so there are, you know, side effects of any treatment. I think generally they're tolerated pretty well. Um, some of the things that I think that are important, as they talked about recovery from surgery or when going through radiation therapy in terms of, you know, staying active and, and exercising, um, those things can be beneficial. Um, I don't want to take up time because I know we're going to be going into um, uh, Mr. Kelly's discussion, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end about the specifics. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I know, uh, Dr. Regime, you talked a lot about radiation. Is there anything you wanted to add uh, to this discussion before we move forward? Uh, so the only thing to highlight, I guess, is that for metastatic disease, we do also, we, uh, we can do radiation, but obviously the goals are different in this situation. We are dealing with disease that's not considered curable, but certainly radiation can help with uh, improvement of quality of life. Uh, if uh, one of the areas that cancer likes to spread is bones and the lymph nodes, oftentimes we're treating patients who have disease that's going through the spinal cord and other bones and, and can cause uh, pain, or even if there's no pain, if there's a critical area that we feel may, may fracture, we may treat, treat preemptively. Uh, and uh, the other difference is that if we're treating in this setting, we generally speaking, using much lower doses and fewer treatments. So it could be done in a couple of days and, and transition or continue on systemic therapy and basically kind of treat on a nice needed basis. Perfect. Thank you so much for your input, doctors. Uh, your knowledge is so well appreciated. So we're going to take a step away from the, the science of it and the, the, the treatment of it and we're going to bring Mr. Marion Kelly up. If he could talk to us about the launch 
of this coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer. Mr. Kelly, welcome. Thank to you. Me. Thank you, Dr. Baker. And I'd also like to, uh, to thank the panelists um, for the incredible information that they brought this evening. Um, because I know within the Black community, we don't get it as direct um, as we are getting it now. And Dr. McIntosh's candor um, has really helped uh, the community this evening. So thank you so much. Um, I am excited about the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer. And so in order to tell you why I'm so excited, um, and why we're launching now, I have to give you a little bit of background about an organization that existed for the last 11 years that I'm equally excited about and will continue, but we are expanding. So the Coalition of Blacks Against Breast Cancer, uh, many of you may know that that was our initial organization that we launched in um, 2010. Uh, Dr. Michelle Halyard, who's not able to be here tonight, and I launched that not-for-profit 11 years ago and have been um, nurturing it to the point today that we've been able to hire an executive director uh, through a relationship with Mayo Clinic, that's in Denise Johnson, and it's grown tremendously to the point that we are now able to expand our outreach um, to create a new entity uh, within the cancer space. So we are in the phase of rebranding the Coalition of Blacks Against Breast Cancer to become the Coalition of Blacks Against Cancer. And under that umbrella organization, we will have varying cancers. So we've had breast cancer the first 11 years. We have now added, this is a soft launch of the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer. Dr. Halyard and I did not have the capacity to do the expansion. And fortunately, we, we were able to uh, reach out to our colleagues, Dr. Humphreys, Dr. Moore, and Dr. Baker um, to lead this initiative from a clinician standpoint to carry the, uh, the weight, if you will, for the CBPC. So the CBBC and CBPC are the two um, sort of pillars that fit under the Coalition of Blacks Against Cancer. And let me also add that don't let the name exclude you from the organization. Um, however, our focus will be on the patient of African descent. As you have heard, um, the outcomes of those patients specifically um, are not the best. They're worse than the um, non-African descent patients. And so for that reason, we thought it was important that we focus on the population. Prostate cancer is prostate cancer and you will benefit whether you are of African descent or not. So know that we're open to anyone that chooses to come to the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer. There's also a personal reason that I'm excited about the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer. It's not because I'm older than 60, but it is because my grandfather and my father both died of prostate cancer. And so I was excited that we were bringing this new um, entity to the Coalition of Blacks Against Cancer because now it's personal for me. Not that I had not been impacted by breast cancer, but when you have a father, a grandfather, and now I'm of the next uh, generation uh, to be concerned about my health, this will be extremely helpful for me. Um, when we get back to meeting face-to-face, -face, the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer will meet on the very same Sunday as the Coalition of Blacks Against Breast Cancer on the opposite end of the building. Um, and so there'll be more information coming about that. But um, this group that is assembled here tonight is really part of this soft launch to let you, the public, the community, and understand that you and I sit right in the middle of community. Without you and I, there is no community. And so we wanted to bring, direct, bring it directly to you. Um, the other thing that I would implore you to consider if you are a patient that is getting a checkup where you get treated matters. 
So I told you that my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. That was um, tw more than 28 years ago. I've, I've been at Mayo Clinic for 28 years. Um, they told my father that he had about six months to live um, and go and have a great life. They would keep him pain free. And about that time, um, I was also interviewing at Mayo Clinic. And part of my reason for saying yes to come to Mayo Clinic was because they said they would see my father as a patient, uh, as part of the package, if you will. Don't tell anyone that. Um, and they saw my father and said, who diagnosed you, who gave you a death sentence? And I was at a, at a reputable uh, academic medical center in the Midwest. I was the assistant dean for admissions and student affairs at the medical school. And so this was a, um, a well thought of institution who just gave my father a death sentence for six months. Um, when I got to Mayo Clinic and he came as a patient and they said, you know, you're a, you're a young man. Um, I don't think you're going to die from prostate cancer. You're gonna die, <laughs> but it's not gonna be anytime soon, nor will it be from prostate cancer. They gave my father 15 more years of life that I would not have had with him. Um, and so for that, I'm grateful. So that is part of the excitement that I have for launching and this soft launch this evening, the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to share about that, Dr. Baker. Awesome, thank you so much. And that is absolutely a firsthand experience and very well thought out presentation on why it's important to really educate yourself and your family and to have the right uh, places to go for treatment because it does make a difference. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, vitamin D replacement. Uh, and Dr. Norfeld is here to help us uh, through this. Uh, Dr. Norfeld, can you give us a little input on what the differences in the effects of uh, vitamin D replacement is amongst uh, African-Americans with uh, prostate cancer? Uh, sure, thank you, uh, Dr. Baker. Um, there's quite a lot of information uh, that's been developed over the years telling us that African-American men uh, tend to have lower levels of vitamin D. Uh, and there's also a lot of information that suggests that vitamin D is an important uh, driver of good immune system function and may be involved in reducing the impact of cancer. Uh, along with my colleagues at uh, the Mayo Clinic in Florida, uh, we're generating a program uh, that's gonna begin early next year where we're gonna look at the opportunity to uh, improve the vitamin D levels of African-American men with prostate cancer and determine how well that works to improve their immune system function. The connection to the prostate cancer then will be that we're hopeful that uh, by improving immune system function, we are going to be able to improve uh, these men's uh, ability to fight the prostate cancer. So again, we know that uh, as a group, African-American men have lower vitamin D levels. Uh, we also know, of course, that prostate cancer uh, has a big burden on uh, the health of uh, African-American men. So in this program uh, that's being launched uh, by Mayo Clinic in Florida and Mayo Clinic in Arizona, the following thing will happen. Uh, African-American men with prostate cancer will be, in, uh, will be invited in to Mayo Clinic. A blood specimen will be taken and their vitamin D level will be measured. And also some uh, measurement of immune system function uh, will be uh, obtained from that blood specimen. Those men will then be given a vitamin D replacement. That's uh, pills or capsules of vitamin D that they'll take on a daily basis for about eight weeks. After that eight weeks of treatment with uh, vitamin D, the blood will be drawn again, measuring the vitamin D levels again. We wanna make sure that we're improving vitamin D levels, so we have to check it again to see that that has happened. And then those measurements of immune system function will be repeated uh, to determine whether we've also improved 
uh, immune system function uh, in those men with prostate cancer. I, I wanna just emphasize a couple of points about this. Uh, there's no placebo. In other words, everybody's going to get the vitamin D because the purpose is to compare what the immune system looks like before the vitamin D and what it looks like after the vitamin D. So everybody in, in the program is gonna receive the vitamin D. Everybody's gonna go through the same measurements of immune system function before and after the vitamin D supplementation. We're very excited about this uh, opportunity that uh, uh, is gonna be available to American, uh, African-American men with prostate cancer. Uh, to determine whether the vitamin D improvement that we can bring about can also improve immune system function. And then secondarily, we're uh, hopeful that that will improve uh, that person's ability uh, to work against their prostate cancer. I, I should just say uh, parenthetically that, you know, vitamin D is, is being considered an important nutrient now for many, many uh, uh, body functions. For example, there's uh, some concern that uh, low vitamin D levels may make a person more susceptible to illness related to coronavirus. So in other words, that COVID would be a worse disease in a person with low vitamin D levels, and that's being actively investigated as well. So there are a lot of connections between vitamin D, immune system function, and possibly uh, the ability to fight against prostate cancer and we're hoping to uh, provide this opportunity early next year uh, for African-American men to test this out with us. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. Dr. Norfeld, as you know, uh, I talk to patients every day and I find that many of them, even though we're in the Valley of the Sun, their vitamin Ds are extremely low. And I'm finding people not just mildly low, I'm talking people in the sevens, the eights, you know, below 10. So uh, I, I actively treat them. I actively tell all of my patients and all the people I talk, especially about COVID, to maintain uh, their vitamin intake, especially vitamin D is, is very important. So thank you so much for this information you've given us. My privilege. So we're gonna move forward into questions and answers. And uh, we've had a couple of questions sitting, uh, sitting by. Uh, one from uh, Brian Nichols, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, Humphreys has started this. Did you uh, completely answer this question, Dr. Humphreys? Well, I think I, I think we led into Dr. Moore talking about biochemical recurrence and um, the biology uh, behind that. We can get into more details if if that wasn't enough. Uh, I'm sure. So yeah, Mr. Nich Mr. Nichols, if there's more that you need to know about that, please just. Uh, we, we can add more to that discussion if needed. Uh, Mr. Reddy, I believe this is, asked, and I, he put DPE, and I'm thinking he's talking about digital rectal exam or DPE. Have I, think he, I think he means benign prostatic enlargement. Oh, have a percent uh, correlation. We, we've, we've, got, we've got so many acronyms. It can be BPH, BPE, blah, okay. little obstruction, those kind of things. That's my guess. I, I hope that I'm uh, interpreting that right. Um, you know, from my standpoint and a urology standpoint, does uh, prostate enlargement have a correlation with prostate cancer? It's an interesting question, and uh, you can find data studies both ways. Um, so there is an association um, on people that have um, prostate cancer and whether they've got benign enlargement as well as those that have enlargement that actually have prostate cancer. There's no direct correlation that just because you have an enlarged prostate, you're going to have prostate cancer. Um, but there is some early evidence of the biology of the disease that shows that those mechanisms that cause enlargement um, it may be something close to an inflammatory pathway that causes enlargement, may have something to do with the pathway that causes genetic abnormalities that can cause the cells within the prostate to form cancer. So um, there isn't a direct relationship that's proven out that is a factor as a risk factor, but sometimes you can see the disease in uh, context. So for example, when we're doing a benign surgery, not for cancer, where we just remove part of the prostate to make it easy for men to pee, about 10% of the time we find incidental prostate cancer. But it tends to be a lower grade, a lower aggressive disease when we find it. So 
Um, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, because the reason why I was thinking about uh, DRE is because I actually was going to ask a question about what was mentioned earlier by any of the panels that can help me through this, and that is PSA above a 0.7, I think was said, increases lifetime risk. What is the risk of only doing a PSA and not a DRE? Uh, is there increased risk of missing cancer or, or, or what's the take now? I know this goes back and forth. If you talk to me, the urologist, I'm going to say a DRE is an important part because we're, we're looking at several things. I think a lot of people have moved away from doing the digital rectal exam as part of the physical exam. Um, but it tells us several things about rectal tone. It tells us things about the prostate size. And there's a difference if we find prostate cancer and it's palpable disease, um, the staging of that cancer is different than if we just find that prostate cancer because of a PSA. So from a urology standpoint, um, we call it the urology handshake. You still have to have the urology handshake because that provides important information for diagnosis, prognosis, and some of those things. Some people rely a little bit on PSA, but, but I'd be a little careful just relying only on PSA. Um, there is a very subset, a uh, small type of prostate cancers where the cells are so abnormal, they forget to produce PSA or they're not capable of making PSA because they're so de-differentiated and it's high grade. So it's not a large proportion of cancers that are there, but DRE is still, at least in my perspective and in my literature, an important part of a physical exam and part of the prostate testing. I don't know how Dr. Moore uh, feels about that or uh, Dr. Uh, I don't know that that's, I still do digital rectal exams on everybody. Dr. McIntosh can attest. <laughs> well, I do have a question. Uh, you know, is there any self-exam? I mean, like breast cancer, you know, they talk about, you know, doing self-exam, women doing self-exams, right? Is there any self-exam that men, especially African-American men can do that, would suggest that they need to go get tested? Not so much a self-exam for prostate cancer. Uh, we do still recommend a testicular exam. Uh, testicular cancer can still happen. So doing a self-exam on the testicles, feeling for lumps or bumps, things like that. But really for screening, the most important thing is that PSA. And it's really that PSA in the 40s where we talk about 0 0.7, uh, that's the important one. So in your 50s, we expect the PSA to be more than 0 0.7. Um, but if it comes back at 5, 16, things like that, we need to look at it more. And, and again, I would just encourage the audience to know that PSA isn't the only thing that matters. There are other things that can cause elevated PSA, but that's our first signal to look deeper and to figure out what's going on and, and really try and make sure there isn't disease that we need to deal with. Follow up question to that. If you have, if someone like my father, you know, I found out uh, had uh, uh, prostate cancer, should the screening, uh, if someone in your family has prostate cancer and has, you know, suffered from that, should your screening start at an earlier age? That's a, that's a great question. So Dr. Moore alluded to this earlier that different organizations have their different screening outlines. I go from the largest study um, published to date about prostate cancer and the natural history of the disease. That's where I come up with that 40. But for African-American men, most of the screening protocols, regardless of who's putting them forward, say start at age 45. Um, from non-African-American males, most screening guidelines say start at age 50. And for those that have a positive family history, a relative, uh, you need to start at age 40. Screening before age 40 is not really productive. Uh, at least the data hasn't shown that yet. Um, but certainly instead of waiting till 50, starting at uh, 40 is important for those people that have family risk. Thank you so much, Dr. Humphreys. Dr. Moore, uh, I know uh, you have some... Uh some of your insight about uh, uh, the digital rectal exam, as well as if you could expand on this biochemical reoccurrence as well, I would greatly sure. appreciate it. Sure. Um, so I guess the question in looking at it was, you had prostatectomy and everything was as uh, clear, and then later on the PSA recurred and how can this happen? So um, as Dr. Humphreys, I'm sure, um, 
could mention, you know, when they go in and remove the um, prostate gland, they, they do their best and to confirm and to get clear margins. Um, however, it is possible that you can have what we call micrometastatic disease, where there's small cells that have escaped from the prostate gland and it, um, maybe to the lymph nodes or, or um, distant. Um, and then over time, um, they're, a lot, you know, once the surgery is out, the prostate and the large um, degree of the prostate cancer is gone, but those cells are still there, and over time, they may start to um, grow again. And then as they do, the PSA will rise, and that's what we, and then we um, determine biochemical recurrence. Um, so in that um, situation, as you did have, um, and Dr. Rajema can speak to this, um, salvage radiation therapy can be useful. Um, and then if if um if there's not uh I, I once i guess at this point it looks like you've completed your radiation therapy and so the the plan would be to monitor um the PSA again now that you've completed radiation therapy um and then if that were to again recur then the suspicion would be that those cells did not just escape out of the prostate into the regional lymph nodes or area that, that could be treated with radiation, but that perhaps they traveled distantly. And that's really when we start looking at what we call systemic therapy or whole body treatment. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, I'm stepping in for Dr. Baker. He has another town hall that he's doing and he had to, to log on for that. There are a couple of additional questions that are in the chat. Um, most of them have been answered, but I want to uh, focus on a couple that may have not been answered in, in, in previous comments. Um, the, the biggest question on here for me that I think our audience needs to hear is the answer to, is prostate cancer curable? And I will open that up to whichever of the physicians would like to respond. Dr. Rajima. <laughs> so obviously we take into consideration, uh, that's why we keep emphasizing early presentation is important because if patients present with what we consider localized prostate cancer, uh, that's still considered curable, meaning it has not left the prostate. It, can, it may still be, even if it started kind of encroaching into the wall of the gland and maybe gotten into seminal vesicles, there's still a chance of cure. But once it goes into lymph nodes and beyond, uh, usually we consider that incurable. But again, with prostate cancer, it may not be uh, imminently life-threatening even if it's spread because it can be slow growing and controlled over years uh, in many situations. So you kind of have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis, but that, that would be my answer. I would also add that that's a bit of a loaded question because the current prostate cancer that you have may be cured, <laughs> but you could have another occurrence at some other point. Uh, Dr. Humphreys, you have anything to add to the question or Dr. Moore, I see that you're not muted. Yeah, so I would agree that a lot of prostate cancers are curable. It just depends on what it is and, and where they are. Um, the good thing about prostate cancer is you have options. The bad thing about prostate cancer is you have options. There's a lot of different ways to get to the end result. But whether you have surgery or radiation, if we take the majority of prostate cancers together, you're going to be alive from that disease. Um, there's even good 20-year survival. And so uh, it is one of those things that is curable. And if not, it's manageable. Prostate cancer isn't like bladder cancer, where bladder cancer can progress very rapidly and your lifespan can be measured in months. With prostate cancer, very similar to breast cancer, we measure your survival in years, if not decades. So it, it's important to think about, yes, this is a malignancy, but not only is it curable, but it's also treatable and you can treat it with good quality of life. And some of the things that have come out in the oncology world for advanced metastatic hormone and sensitive disease are really changing uh, the paradigm and how we think and treat prostate cancer. Thank you, Dr. Humphreys. Um, I, I think it's important for me to also share I spoke of my father's treatment and he lived 15 years longer because he went somewhere different. But there were also some procedures done along those 15 years that kept him alive. So I don't want you to think that the other 
cancer center just gave him a death sentence and threw him out to, to die. Yeah. Um, Mayo Clinic did a more thorough uh, approach to his prostate cancer. Um, th the next question is one can that- I, um, can, I, can I interject on that question? I think that from the cancer survivor, is it curable? Absolutely. I think that the key is education. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I know you're talking from a scientific perspective, but you know, I'm talking from a reality perspective. You know, I had it. I got that death sentence, but I li I sit in front of you today, cancer free. So when you ask that question, I can answer it unequivocally. Yes, is cancer curable? Is prostate cancer curable? Absolutely. I think the key is is educating people in early detection. You know, we can talk about this all day long, but if we don't educate people on the importance of getting a uh, screen and early detection, it's not going to happen. But if we get people like you were saying, get people to the Mayo Clinic, just as I had to do, I, I, I sit here and I listen to your story. That sounds like my story. Mayo Clinic wasn't my first stop. It was my second stop. Thank God I did stop. But if the more that we can get people out there and the more that we can get people screened, the more lives we can save. So to answer your question, yes, prostate cancer is curable. The key is, is can we get to the people before it's too late? Thank you. Um, another question that I'm not sure that was uh, even approached, but it's an important one. They're all important questions. Uh, I'm trying to prioritize those that have not been answered at all. Can a vasectomy increase your risk for prostate cancer. So th that's in my world. I do both uh, vasectomies and prostate cancer. Uh, it, it's a great question. They've looked at this in the meta, meta analysis and all the data shows that a vasectomy for um, permanent uh, birth control does not increase or change your risk of prostate cancer. So you don't have to worry about vasectomies and prostate cancer. Thank you, Dr. Humphreys. And the last question I'm going to ask and I'd like each of the physician panelists to, um, to respond briefly, um, is what can I do to help prevent prostate cancer? And we will start with Dr. Moore. Okay, um, so, and I also, there was a question about lutetium, which is a huge hot topic in prostate cancer, so I can address that at the end as well. Um, but, uh, so preventing prostate cancer, um, you know, we talked about there are certain risk factors that aren't necessarily, you know, with aging that you can't avoid that. Um, family history, um, but you can, you know, there have been, there, there are some ongoing studies looking at different things that could potentially either increase your risk or decrease your risk. And I think most of those are ongoing, um, but, it, but there are also some things that are associated with um, if you are diagnosed, worse outcome, you know, if you have other um, comorbidities or diseases like diabetes that are uncontrolled, hypertension that's uncontrolled, um, obesity, you know, there, those are things that you can just overall improve your general health, um, which, which can then improve outcomes. Um, and then really, it's, it's a matter of there's probably not anything that we have to date to say that you can do to avoid being diagnosed. But again, as we've been talking about the screening being so important that if you are um, diagnosed, being diagnosed, diagnosed early when you still have a localized disease that can be cured. Thank you. Dr. Regime, anything to add? Uh, I think that's pretty much what I would say, maintaining good health and reducing, uh, you know, uh, risk of diabetes and obesity, you know, eating right, exercising, all those things that help with general good health, what should help uh, reduce the risk. And of course, you know, making sure that one is uh, screened early. My dear, my dear friend, Dr. Northfeld, who's big into nutrition and exercise, is, is there anything you'd add? Well, that, that's a great intro. Uh, thank you, Marion. That I could talk all day long about how good nutrition and good physical activity strategies can reduce the risk for all kinds of cancers. And, you know, when we get people on a good nutritional strategy or a physical activity strategy to reduce prostate cancer risk, guess what? They also have a reduced risk of colon cancer. And guess what? They also have a reduced risk for complications of diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, strokes. Uh, so 
there's there's no way we could leave a conversation like this without emphasizing that people need to eat right, people need to exercise, you need to talk to your doctors about this or other trusted people who know what to do with these features of everyday living that can reduce cancer risk. And Dr. Humphreys, anything you'd like to add? No, I think everybody said it, and I think they've said it very well. Um, what I tell my patients is the largest study uh, done to date on prostate cancer health was actually done by the American Heart Association, and they did it to look at cardiac health, but they did a sub-analysis, and they found that the American Heart Association diet for a cardiac health actually is prostate healthy, and so it's prostate cancer healthy. Uh, it's also preventative, healthy. And so if you're looking for an easy guideline to think about from a dietary standpoint, the American Heart Association has the largest population study when it comes to that. And so that's where I generally start people. Uh, but these are all excellent points. And I think if anybody thinks about it, you got to think global. It's not just one part of you. It's diet, exercise, lifestyle. These are the things that impact the disease the most. And the right positive mental attitude. You've heard from Dr. McIntosh and how incredible he is when he comes into this and, and he decides to be a survivor. And, and you can't say enough about uh, the emotional and the intellect and your spirit as you attack these type of diseases. Thank you. And before I close out, Dr. Moore, might you answer the question about Lou PSMA? Uh, sure. So basically, uh, you know, we talked about the advances that are being made in prostate cancer, which is really amazing. And um, most recently, the development of a PSMA, which is a more um, sensitive test for prostate cancer. And, and initially, it's been approved for diagnostic purposes, but there have been trials going on and um, the biggest one was vision where they looked at men with widely metastatic prostate cancer. So the disease that had spread um, throughout the body who had already um, progressed through all lines of therapy. And they basically took these men and um, put them through the PSMA PET scan. And if their disease showed up, they went on to treat them with the PSMA lutetium, which is um, basically sort of like a smart bomb to the prostate cancer. Um, and they have had encouraging results that was just reported this past year in both progression-free survival and overall survival. And so that's going to be an area where there's now going to be expanded access to that. There's going to be more studies to that. And it's probably the next, uh, next big treatment coming down the pike for um, metastatic disease. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to, to thank Ed Baker uh, for being our facilitator this evening, uh, had to step off. And so you got the B team now stepping in to, to complete the rest of the, the town hall. Um, Dr. Duane uh, McIntosh, thank you so much as a, as a sole survivor on here to bring a very different but real and needed perspective to this conversation and discussion. Without you, it would not have been the same. I'd also like to thank Dr. Uh, to Dr. Baker for being the lone non-Mayo Clinic clinician who is, was engaged today and is also going to help lead the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer. Uh, my, my dear colleagues, uh, Dr. Rajima, Dr. Northfeld, Dr. Humphreys, Dr. Moore, thank you. Always appreciate you saying yes to these requests that we ask of you. Uh, who you don't see who are behind the scenes are the brains of the operation. Um, Adali Kulyar, uh, Denise Johnson, Farhia Omar, and we could not have done this without our incredible media tech team, Michael Reading, Ray Perneau. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, a reminder that the Coalition of Blacks Against Prostate Cancer, uh, this was a soft launch. In 2022, we will begin meeting face-to-face uh, we are deciding now if we can have a virtual space, um, and that would be in October, perhaps, uh, if we are able to have uh, to kick that meeting off. But those discussions are still being held. Uh, we certainly look forward um, to engaging the entire community, but specifically the community of African descent in these further dialogues about prostate cancer. If we don't talk about it, it's going to kill us. Thank you all so much this evening. Thank you, Mayo Clinic, for hosting this platform. And everyone have a great evening. Thank you.